welcome to the session on uh, contract driven development we're lucky to have naresh himself with us today and uh, just to add a little bit uh, since i know a little bit about this topic uh, you're all in for a real treat so without further ado over to you naresh right thanks jaydeep this is a very interesting topic uh, for me personally and i hope that you will uh, you know like this topic as well so let me quickly uh, put this in a slide show mode so the topic that i have today is contract driven development and uh, the tall claim that i want to make is basically this is the end of integration hell uh, and this is the end of integration tests if you will uh, so i'm going to talk about how we can completely eradicate uh, integration tests uh, as we go along uh, i want to start with a simple logical application architecture of a e-commerce uh, app uh, you know you have a set of uh, micro front ends if you will uh, a product listing front end a cart front end a, a payments front end and uh, they talk to uh, a set of microservices which could be your product catalog services your order management services payment services and so forth and they have certain external dependencies which is basically you know uh, authentication payment gateways in fact you have multiple payment gateways and then you have inventory management system and a whole ton of other dependencies and then uh, for most of us who work in cross functional teams we kind of create these kinds of squads uh, you know or scrum teams which basically cut across the application Uh, your e-commerce store application and another application which is the warehouse uh, management system application uh, each of them have a set of services within them uh, as you can see here um, let me bring this uh, laser pointer here yeah so you can see these uh, warehouse related services and then you have this e-commerce related services uh, they all uh, you know we do api testing of these in our uh, you know ci environments or other kinds of environment and then when uh, it's time to integrate we bring them all into a common system integration testing environment throw everything together along with some external services and then we start testing these things and we hope everything here is going to be seamless we'll do end to end functional tests we'll do some work api workflow tests uh, and then everything looks good then we will push it to a pre production where some business acceptance test will happen and everything will be smooth nothing no problem ever happens and then we go straight to production uh how many of you are familiar with this uh with this approach of testing uh give me a thumbs up awesome love that uh cool so this is familiar and i'm not talking anything alien to you guys perfect now what happens uh, of course we expect everything to work smoothly rarely they do uh you know again not in your organization but in your competitors organization right uh what happens is one of those dependencies that you expected to work fine suddenly shows up because there may be a schema mismatch there may be uh you know an additional field required or there may be some uh, api that's deprecated what not uh and this does not work as you expect uh this basically makes the entire uh you know your sit environment unstable which basically means this cannot move forward and uh, of course the oms uh, you know developer would say hey just give me half an hour it should be a quick fix and two weeks later the quick fix is not still arrived um sounds familiar all right perfect um uh, so this is the current state of testing in unfortunately in a lot of organization and it and this is something i have personally lived through myself in various different organizations uh so the question is what can we do about this uh you know in a nutshell if you if you experience something like this this is what we call as integration hell there are many different types of integration hell i just demonstrated one type of integration hell uh and you must be pulling your hair uh out uh trying to deal with this issue good news is uh there is there is a, a light at the tunnel uh, end of the tunnel but what is most important as part of this session is to speak about myself uh right because that's why you're here you're here to admire me and all the great stuff that i've done so i'm going to spend the next uh, 30 minutes or so uh you know talking about myself uh and then we'll spend the last 2 minutes talking about how to deal with uh, integration hell all right <laughs> so my name is naresh jain uh, i used to be an adventure sports freak as you can see from my current shape i'm completely out of shape 
uh, cannot really do any much adventure sports now. I live in uh, Mumbai, don't act in Bollywood yet. Someday uh, when they need a fat big guy, uh, I probably will be there. Uh, I run a consulting company called Exensio, uh, which is basically helping organizations across a whole gamut of uh, different skills. But uh, I mean, we basically kind of uh, talked about as, as you know, we help uh, engineer a BS, the, the business DNA to transform for a digital future. I uh, happened to start my career uh, in a strange place called ISRO, uh, where I was building neural networks for classifying remote satellite images. Of course, uh, back in the days, uh, neural networks were shit and we couldn't do anything much. Uh, but that helped me land a job in a bank uh, to, to basically test their uh, neural network models that they were building for equity research. And that's really what got me into testing to start with. Uh, and I was fascinated. I mean, this whole field of uh, testing fascinated me. But what I realized is just how bad uh, the state of testing in general was. And it was not so much to do with the state of testing, but it was so much to do with the state of development. So I looked around and I found this company, ThoughtWorks. And back then, uh, I think I was some 30th or 40th employee in the company. Uh, and I, I, I joined the company because I saw, oh, Martin Fowler's company, right? And in fact, back in those days, couldn't even pronounce his name. We used to say Martin Flower. Uh, it's Martin Flower's company, right? Like, so we should go join this company and learn how development can be done and how extreme programming can be done. And I actually learned a great deal of things at ThoughtWorks in terms of how uh, extreme programming practices can be applied, how you can do test-driven development, how you can do clean code practices, refactoring, and, and all the amazing stuff. Until I ended up in this company uh, called DirectEye, where I literally got a cultural shock because everything that I believed are sound engineering practices that one must do. Uh, these guys violated every single one of them, and they were still like extremely successful. Like, for example, they recently sold one of their businesses for nine hundred million dollars. Uh, you know, and and it's pretty amazing success story. Uh, but what I found is that you know, you cannot be dogmatic about these things. You you have to be very pragmatic about this. I saw the same thing happen again at Hike, which was one of the uh, unicorns in India. And, uh, you know, a lot of things that, again, you believe uh, are sound engineering practices and must have uh, were not there. So what's that pragmatic balance that one needs to have to basically build world class products? Uh, that's been my quest uh, for many years. Uh, I was also a partner at a company called Industrial Logic, where we were building these e-learning, training people how to uh, learn some of these skills. Uh, I got bored out of that. I started a company called Adventure Labs, we were building games for kids to learn mental arithmetics. Uh, of course, it, the, the startup did not uh, go as we expected. Maybe a lot of people say we were too early ahead of our time. Uh, I also happened to start the Agile movement here in India, have been running a whole bunch of different conferences. And uh, uh, you, as you can say, I'm quite passionate about building communities and uh, you know, sharing uh, and uh, you know, learning from other people. Uh, it, it, to scratch my own personal itch, I built a platform called Confingen, uh, which, which ironically, uh, I, I know the, the, the idea with Confingen was I want to just do a pet project and a kind of an experiment. And I decided not to write any tests. And so even till now, Confingen has very, very few uh, automated tests. It's pretty much, uh, you know, uh, test less, if you will, uh, like serverless, you know, it's test less. Uh, and these days, I have, uh, for the last year and a half, I've been uh, helping Geo uh, transform into a digital native company. Uh, and it's been a fascinating journey. Again, you know, uh, just amazed at what these guys have been able to do. Uh, and it's, it's been quite interesting. So anyway, the, enough about me. I was just joking that I'm going to spend the next 30 minutes. By now, I feel few people would have already dropped off. Uh, but anyway, we should talk about integration health. That's, that's why we are here. And that's, that's what we need to do. So coming back to, uh, to this diagram that we had earlier uh, about uh, you know, uh, how we do testing. So one of the things what we found is, uh, you know, if if we can introduce a new, uh, you know, we can shift some of the testing from SIT environment early on. Maybe we have a chance to to kind of uh, catch some of these integration issues much earlier. So the idea was basically, 
think can we create a, a, an environment which is a more controlled environment what i mean by control is you only deploy in this environment the pieces that you know you are working on your team is working on everything else uh, including this dependency between these other project and external dependencies are all stubbed out and then you do uh, what used to be workflow tests that were run in an sit environment if you can move that to this environment uh, then you know what we found interesting is a lot of things could be caught here earlier on uh, right so this is your basic shift left uh, kind of an idea uh, and these uh, external dependencies are actually dependent on something uh, called an executable contract and that's kind of what i will focus majority of this talk on uh, but uh, you know you you take my word for now uh, saying there are there are contracts that are executable contracts and you can use those uh, to stub out these external dependencies uh and that basically is what allows you to stub out these uh to do service virtualization in a intelligent manner and then uh, do a whole lot of uh, controlled environment testing so that you know uh, quite a lot of integration issues much earlier before they would fail uh now what might happen if if one of those dependencies that particular environment can become unstable but the rest of them can still uh you know this will not move forward to the sit but the rest of it can move forward and that will not make your sit unstable uh so at least those pieces of functionality could move forward uh, of course you need other techniques like feature lookups and so forth uh, which we will talk about uh, later but uh you know you don't become in the critical path now of moving the releases forward uh, if you just start shifting left right like that's the key idea like shift left uh have a controlled environment in which you can stub out external dependencies using an intelligent service virtualization piece and uh ola like a lot of uh, integration problems can go away it won't become zero but a lot of them can be caught much earlier on and uh, addressed so i want to quickly jump uh here and talk about an application test pyramid uh i think uh, james grenning in his keynote also talked about the test pyramid uh i i had been playing around with the test pyramid now for about 12 13 years i've tweaked uh tweaked the test pyramid a little bit uh so i'll i'll talk about that uh, in a minute uh so i mean this is no surprise so everyone understands at the base of this pyramid uh you're basically looking at uh you know unit tests which basically test each of these service uh, components of the services in isolation uh each of these are tested in isolation you can use uh frameworks like makito moq mock jest any of them to stub out uh you know uh, other classes or other files other functions uh and yeah unit testing is again no no big no big deal uh everything is tested in isolation so basically sometimes people prefer calling these as unit isolation tests which means there is no interaction between any of the components on top of this we basically have something called as the component test or the service test so if you if you're thinking of a back end service then it's an api test is a, is a service test uh you know if you're thinking of front end components then basically each of your uh, ui components uh you know could be treated as uh you know a component and been tested in again isolation what you will notice here is you know a new set of connections have opened up uh these were all the, the you see these green arrows uh these were all in isolation uh, earlier and now they start talking to each other so the order controller is now talking to the order repository that's talking to the database and for dependency on this other service which is your own service but it's still a different service a microservice uh for that you use a contract and you stub that out and then this piece only operates within the itself so this microservice is completely self controlled does not interact with any of the external things wherever it needs external it just looks at a stub uh you know and the same thing with each of these so that's your uh you know component tests or service tests and basically uh, there is a, a connections between internal units and modules within a particular service uh, and any external services that you have are uh, external dependencies are also stubbed out using these contracts uh, are you with me so far uh, just quick show of uh, uh, quick thumbs up awesome awesome okay great 
So everyone's with me, nothing serious here in the chat. Uh, okay, that's good. Let me go back here uh, and start the slideshow. We talked about unit tests, we talked about component tests. Uh, you'd also look on the left, we are talking about what environment you're running in. So this is your local environment, this is your dev environment because uh, you know different developers might be working on these different components and you want to uh, integrate as early as possible and test them as quickly as possible. Uh, on top of that is your, uh, you know, in environment for application testing, which is where you run application tests. Uh, and what are application tests? So, you know, basically, uh, if I take the e-commerce example, you would notice all these green arrows. Now they are all talking to each other. The earlier they were not talking to each other. Now each of these guys are talking to each other. Uh, so now this application test basically cuts across your entire application, front end, back end, et cetera, et cetera. And it still does not talk to external service. You will notice there is no green arrow between uh, any of these to these external services. And this is what we call as uh, basically application tests. And they uh, test your entire application in isolation of any external dependencies. This is that environment that I was talking about, the new environment in which you will do this kind of tests, And you will run against these external contracts. Uh, and finally, uh, you would have, uh, you know, your system tests, which is basically where you would put uh, into an integrated environment and run these system tests. And this is where you will notice these green arrows are going off to these external dependencies. And this is where you are kind of completely testing as a system, as a holistic system, not just as an application, but as an Pyramid, and then uh, if we uh, move forward, then you will see that you can now stack up a bunch of these application uh, together, and then on top of that, you can put another pyramid, uh, which is basically your user acceptance and performance tests, and then shadow mode tests, which is basically you know uh, your testing in production kind of a thing. Uh, so that is what I call as the complete product test pyramid. Uh, which, which has n number of uh, application uh, uh, test pyramids at below, and then you stack them up together to build on top of that your uh, you know product uh, test pyramid. Uh, and you would also notice the various different environments in which uh, we can run these tests. Uh, you know, local dev, uh, eat, SIT, pre prod, and production. Is it uh, making sense so far? All right, great. Thank you. Uh, let me you know, go back. So just want to make sure I am, uh, everyone's with me so far, right? Now I want to ask the, you know, uh, million dollar question. So if we did all of this, are you sure that you will solve the integration help? If you if you can please type it out in the chat, uh, you know that would be helpful. So if you think this will solve the integration hell, that's great. If you think it will not solve the integration hell, uh, why don't you type it out? Why why you think it should it won't? Perfect. So Mayuresh says that uh, you know it won't because what if the contracts uh, you know change? Uh, Priyanka is saying, not sure. There are always environments which blast everything at the end. Okay. Okay, so Mayuresh is saying this would work if the contracts don't change. All right. Uh, that's my curious little daughter trying to figure out what the hell I'm doing. Uh, say hi to everyone, Ruhi. All right, uh, environmental factors. Yeah, there's a lot of uh, these factors that we kick in. So uh, communication between the teams and external agencies has to be rock solid. That's a brilliant point again. Uh, yes, uh, those are all very important and valid points. So fantastic. I think uh, I have an awesome crowd here. 
uh, you guys are already uh, you know ahead of me in some sense so yes i mean this will not really solve the problem let's uh, tackle that one by one right uh, i'm guessing everyone's familiar with these uh, typical mocking frameworks you know mockito mockingbird mock mock uh, some of these frameworks ton of them are there out there uh can anyone tell me what is the main problem you face with these mocking frameworks uh type it out in the chat please what are the problems you have faced when you have written tests and you've used one of these mocking frameworks and you've tested with these mocking frameworks if you know the answer just type it out in the chat please you mock them with desired behavior they are again bound to the contract which is the core of the problem we are talking about if the contract changes the mock has to be modified perfect thanks uh, venkat uh, for that right now the mocks uh, we have developed have gone obsolete in our perf environment perfect we are pulling our hair <laughs> absolutely all right so great so let's talk about the problems with these uh, frameworks this these mocking frameworks right uh, i'm sure you would have seen this picture somewhere on the some misunderstanding on your side you did not put the right assertions in your uh, in your mocking framework and uh, you know all your tests were working fine but when the moment you try to integrate with us because you had set the wrong expectations to start with uh, you know you had uh, this mismatch uh, does that sound familiar uh, you know a lot of uh, uh, confusion a lot of finger pointing people talking pointing to uh, documents where uh, they had exchanged over email or in some wiki or something saying look this is what we said this is what we meant this is what happened and there is there is confusion uh so if we go back to this test pyramid you will notice that what we are talking and the key over here is these contracts uh you know everything is dependent on these contracts in some sense for you to really uh, be be sure that when you're testing this uh and saying everything is working fine uh these contracts have to be in sync with what the reality is if they if they go out of sync uh then you might be happily building stuff in your bubble expecting everything to be working fine and the moment you bring it to sit or even for that matter you bring it to uh, your, your application uh, integration level uh and you will notice that there are a lot of surprises so that's the kind of main problem that we found with these contracts is that these contracts a have to be executable they cannot be uh word documents or excel sheets or you know emails or wiki documents these have to be executable specification they have to be uh you know version controlled uh like any other artifact and they have to be part of ci uh for you to get that feedback as early as possible uh so that's kind of basically uh you know the introduction of contract driven development where we are saying hey first of all we need to collaboratively design our uh, our apis our integrations right we have to collaboratively design that and we need a tool where we can collaborate to create that and once we have done that we treat this as a contract as code if you will uh, and then use that as a way uh, to make sure that you know we all stick to that contract and now that allows us to independently deploy our microservices our micro front ends or micro whatever we have uh and and the key thing here is to look at if you can turn those contracts into executable specifications into tests uh then that that goes a long way right so that's in a nutshell what i'm calling as contract driven development where uh you know different providers and uh, consumers come together they do an api first kind of an approach where they collaboratively design what the integration should look like document that in an executable specification and then use that specification to uh, then independently deploy things and they never have to come back and integrate things as long as things are working with the contract 
they should be able to just independently deploy things. So let's look at how that works. So the step one is this collaboratively contract authoring. Now, does this syntax look familiar to you? Let me switch over here real quick. Does that look familiar to you? Double thumbs up for a collaboration tool, perfect. Yes, Gautam, you're absolutely right. It's the good old uh, Gherkin syntax, right? Uh, so essentially, we, we, uh, we saw what a Slack, uh, who's a good friend of mine, did with uh, Cucumber and Gherkin. And that's kind of become a very de facto standard now for a lot of uh, people writing acceptance tests or behavior driven development. And we said, hey, couldn't we just take that and kind of uh, use that with a little bit of tweak? Uh, we, we tweaked that a little bit. And so what you can see here in this example is we are saying, hey, I want to make a post request to this particular OTP URL. And when I do this with request body, what is this request body over here? This request body is defined right over here. These are my types. These are my different types that I have. So this request body contains an error info, a request ID, and a mobile uh, OTP. Uh, mobile OTP happens to be a string. Uh, you know, the request ID happens to be a number. And the error info itself is another kind of uh, uh, type. Uh, which has a question mark, which means it's optional. You know, the value of this could be empty or it could be, it could have a value. When it has a value, this is the structure and this is the data type of this value. And similarly, uh, basically your, your uh, you know, sorry, I was looking at the response uh, body, uh, my bad. Uh, this is the request body right here on the top and this is the response body. Uh, and so basically we are saying that we make a post request with this uh, to this uh, API with this uh, request body that is right here on the top uh, with these three pieces of information with this data type, uh, then we should get a HTTP status 200 back and we should get a response body uh, which matches this particular structure. And here are a few examples that I can feed in and I want to see that this contract is working as I expect. Uh, so we can get together and we can write, we can author this contract. Uh, so far with me on you know the author? Perfect. Uh, very few thumbs up. All right, great. Uh, so that's the step one, right? Collaboratively, uh, collaboratively authoring these contracts. So this is contract first development or contract driven development, right? So we author these contracts first. Uh, we version control these contracts just like any other uh, executable uh, specification. Uh, the only difference is you put them in a central repo where all contracts live. So all your contracts go in a central repo across different teams. And this is where everything gets versioned, everything is, is stayed. Uh, so, the, the, so, so the second step is once you've authored the contract, you push it into a central repo where all contracts live. It's a version controlled uh, artifact. Step number three would be as a, as a service provider, as someone who's building this API, uh, I would basically use this contract test as, as a contract, these executable specifications as test. I can literally go with this, uh, what are you seeing here on the screen? And I'll show this live demo in a minute, but you will literally see here in this 15 lines of uh, code, I essentially can run that executable specification that I just wrote, that contract in Gherkin language. I can run them as tests. You see here at the bottom, these are actually running as tests. Uh, so nothing required on the developer side. Uh, you get these contract tests for free. They run against your API. And you obviously have, have to provide where your uh, API is running. Uh, and then you run against that. And uh, you, know, you should expect to see all these contract paths. So that's uh, step number three. So step number one is collaboratively write the contract. Step number two is check it into a central uh, contract repository. Step number three could be, uh, and this is 3A, I would say, because now you have a fork in the, in the branch uh, where you can, uh, you know, where the provider starts using these tests as, uh, as tests, uh, as, sorry, these contracts as tests. And, uh, on the consumer side, now they can take the same exact contract and with that one little command, which is basically contract stub, 
uh, they can run this in uh, intelligent service virtualization mode, which basically means you can now turn this spec into a uh, into a stub, which is wire compatible uh, with your actual server. If you had your actual server, this would be identical to that. And it basically gives, uh, without writing a single line of code, without writing uh, any, uh, you know, any mocking logic per se on your side, uh, you now have a wire compatible uh, contract, uh, run, uh, wire compatible service virtualization achieved through this contract. I'll show the demo. This is not all hand wavy stuff. This is real stuff that is being used at a very large organization. Uh, so that's that's basically now step 3B, if you will, which is running contract, the same very contract that we wrote in intelligent service virtualization mode. Uh, so before I wrap up, uh, you know, I have 10 minutes to go. Uh, so I'm going to show you some real demo, right? It's not all smokes and mirrors. It's real stuff. All right. Uh, how many people have I lost so far? Oh, okay, good. Uh, looks like most folks are still here. Cool. Show some love, folks. Uh, we need to hit the 5,000 likes mark on this. <laughs> All right, just kidding. Let's quickly jump into, uh, into some code uh, to do some live demo over here. Uh, I'm using a pet store example. That's something that most people can easily relate. It's an e-commerce application for a pet. Uh, and what I have here is is a contract that you're looking at. Uh, is this uh, visible enough? Uh, I can try and uh, make this a little bigger. So what I have is, uh, is, uh, is a set of uh, contracts that I have captured in this uh, contract file. It's called API underscore one dot contract. Uh, and this basically has a, a list of uh, contracts, different scenarios basically for a given endpoint that have been defined. So I have uh, different scenarios, which is basically, uh, you know, here on the top, I've defined some generic uh, data types. Uh, and then here I have some, uh, you know, uh, basically different API. So if I do a, a get on the pet slash ID, then I should be able to fetch the pet and it should have this uh, pet body over here. Uh, I can do same thing with, uh, you know, basically trying to update the pets and providing some data. I should be able to, uh, you know, do a bunch of different things. So this in basically describes all my uh, APIs uh, and I should be able to now um, just go to that little thing that I was showing you earlier. I can just uh, take this and I can uh, click this. There's no other code that I've written. This just this and the API uh, contract that I have. Uh, and with just that, I should be able to now run this uh, as tests. And what you're seeing is, of course, this is bringing up the application here, right here, because this is a, a, you know, a, a Spring Boot application. Uh, and so that brings up the application and it starts running my uh, contract uh, as, as tests against this application. And you'll see here in a minute that it starts executing these uh, specifications that we talked about to make sure that your APIs are working uh, as you expected. There we go. So this is uh, basically running this. It says, hey, when I make this request to slash pet slash 10 uh, get request, uh, I expect uh, I got a 200 okay. I got this kind of a data back and that actually matched with what I wanted. Uh, so that's basically running contract as uh, tests against your uh, API. Now what happens here uh, is interesting. Someone uh, mentioned this earlier. Uh, now this contract was agreed, it's uh, version control uh, and the consumer has, uh, so let's go to the consumer side real quick here. Uh, and uh, let me uh, just show you. Uh, so I've written some, uh, you know, tests on the consumer side, which uh, basically pokes the consumer. And then internally, that consumer basically goes and calls this backend, right? So this is my front end. This is my website stuff where I'm, build, I'm, I'm testing some functionality. Uh, and I'm basically, uh, you know, trying to test if, if, if uh, you know, my logic works correctly in the front end. It happens to have a dependency on this, uh, you know, backend uh, where I'm basically saying, hey, you know, uh, if I hit this uh, URL uh, on the UI, then I should expect uh, certain things uh, to to work uh, as I expect. So if I if I run this, essentially what you will see here is is basically trying to 
uh, stub out uh, the, the contract. And so let me quickly run this. You will see this in a minute. So yeah, everything is fine. Now you will notice right about now, it will bring, it'll look at the contract and it'll say, okay, you know, you, you want to use this contract. So I'm going to uh, bring up this contract in the stub mode. Uh, and I'm going to run this contract uh, so that you can now uh, make calls to it as if the actual server was running. And I will uh, give you uh, the responses that, uh, you know, if you set some expectation, then it will it will return those expectations. If you don't set anything uh, in the contract, it will just randomly generate uh, values which match the specific data types. So uh, let's quickly go here. So the first thing when you started running the test is uh, it does is basically load the config file from uh, this contract.json file, which is where we are defining which contracts we depend on. Uh, so let's quickly look at the contract.json for a minute, just so you understand what's going on over here. So that's my contract.json, which basically says, here's a list of uh, contracts that I depend on. Uh, it's the provider is Git. I can have other kinds of providers like file system and whatnot, but we encourage use people to use uh, the Git. Provide the link to the central repo that I talked about, and then essentially say, "Hey, I'm interested in stubbing this specific contract." Right. So this is all you need to do. Uh, and essentially, if your API test that uh, I was showing here, uh, what we are doing is uh, we are basically saying, uh, you know, right here. To do, do, do. I'm just trying to let me maximize that. So before all, you will see here as a setup step. I'm basically saying create stub, and that's essentially by convention looks at do you have a contract.json file? If you have a contract.json file, let me pull the contract from that repository in real time, uh, get that contract down. Uh, and basically uh, bring up that contract as stuff. So just this one little line you need to write, and you need to put this contract.json file, uh, which tells you where is the uh, where do you find contracts. You could have multiple providers, multiple sources of your contracts because you may have uh, you know different different sources. That's fine. We do encourage just having one central repo, but sometimes people have different repos uh, and so forth. So that's okay. The, the framework allows for that. So just with this one little line, you write that, and then rest of it is just your normal create pet or uh, you know find, search for available dogs uh, kind of test that you're writing. Uh, so far with me, everyone. Okay, awesome. Now the last thing we need to look at is so I've shown you how this intelligent service virtualization works. Uh, I can set certain expectations on this. In this case, uh, I have not set any expectations on the stub, so it's just going to give me some default values when I run the test, and uh, it it all works fine. But what what I just showed you earlier, uh, so uh, right here, JSON file. Uh, it basically looked if I have these contracts locally in my environment. If not, it will basically pull it from the repo. And then you will notice here that it says, yeah, okay, lo using local contracts because nothing has changed since the last time you ran this. And then here it says loading expectations from uh, this particular data folder. And if it found any data inside that folder, then it'll use that data. If it didn't, then it'll just generate that data. So in this case, there were two create RC and uh, available docs to two data files that basically feed uh, the expectations that I had for my uh, for my test, so I, I want a certain kind of a, a response back. Uh, now, when I set this data in this JSON file, like I was saying earlier, this is like setting expectations in mock. Uh, if I set wrong expectations, then uh, then contract will let me know that hey, you're setting wrong expectations and that is not allowed. Okay. Uh, I know I'm running out of time. I'm going to quickly show one last uh, demo, uh, one small piece, uh, which is on the now on the provider side. Uh, one big challenge that typically happens is how do I know that I'm not breaking backward compatibility? Uh, so I, I as I, I, have, I have the contract, I, I have added a new piece to the contract, and I'm just evolving my stuff uh, as we go along. And when I do that, I feel uh, you know the change I'm making is backward compatible. 
But how do I actually verify that I'm not accidentally breaking backward compatibility of my API? Uh, so let's take an example here. Uh, for some reason, I think that this should not be number. This should be a string. So I change the data type. And now, what do you think? This is a backward compatible change or is a backward incompatible change? Okay, uh, let, let's uh, test this out. So I'm going to run contract.push, uh, which is basically going to try and push this contract to the central repo. I made my change. I want to push it in. Uh, I run this contract.push command. And basically what it's going to do is it's going to take the new contract that I have. It's going to run that uh, in, in, uh, in, the, in the stub mode, uh, the service virtualization mode. And it will run the older version of the contract in the test mode against this and see if the older version works as expected. Uh, so you can have new stuff. That's OK. But as long as you have not broken anything old is what this tries to check. And you will notice here it says, you know, expected a number actual was a string. Uh, and it says the new version of the pet store contract is not backward compatible. So it will not allow you to check this in. Uh, and the same command can also be uh, there is a command for just doing a backward compatibility check that could also be run on your CI. So anytime someone, even if they bypass this and checks it in straight, uh, you would have a, a, a check on the PR to, to basically invalidate. A PR is a pull request, sorry, uh, to, to basically push you out saying you cannot uh, push this version of the contract. If you really want to make a change, then bump up the version number and check in so it will be a new version of your contract. Okay, so I believe I have tried to answer both on the provider side and on the consumer side how they can uh, you know, make sure that these things are, uh, once you've written a contract, both of them are running against that. This is all automated. This runs as part of your CI. And now you never have to worry about some of these integration problems that typically show up pretty late in the cycle. Uh, by the way, this is not just for APIs. We also uh, support uh, this tool also supports, uh, you know, Kafka, uh, you know, and other kind of protocols. And we're kind of growing the list of protocols that we support. But uh, API, uh, you know, in terms of, uh, you know, we support REST JSON, we support uh, SOAP XML, uh, we support Kafka, and we are building uh, support for JMS right now. And we kind of keep expanding that scope pretty quickly. So just to wrap up, I know I'm uh, two minutes late, so thanks for bearing with me. Uh, just to wrap up, step one, uh, the takeaway is hyper-collaborate, collaboratively design your APIs over a contract, use a common language to communicate, make that contract an executable contract. So, uh, you know, and shift left, uh, try and test this as early as possible so you can avoid last minute surprises. And this gives you an ability to now do that in a very uh, meaningful manner. Uh, and last step is, you know, if you've done this, then you can start independently deploying your code and bye bye to integration help. Uh, so that's pretty much it. Uh, if you were interested in this demo, the tool that I was using is uh, called contract with a Q. Uh, you can go to this website uh, contract dot run. Uh, and that's uh, that's the website. It's an open source uh, product uh, that we've built and we put it out there. Uh, and we uh, believe that uh, the, you know this. Uh, many more people can contribute to this uh, to this open source project and take it forward. So with that, uh, thank you very much uh, for listening to me. Uh, and uh, Jadeep, do we uh, have a couple of minutes we, for questions? Are there any questions? So there's one interesting question about languages. So the question here is: Does this work with languages other than Java or Kotlin? So maybe the way of consuming that may be a little. Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, the the point is, we did not want to make this language dependent. So everything that you see today is language agnostic because you're writing the contract in in Gherkin, which is language independent, and then you're just using uh, contract commands to run it in stub. So there is contract space stub. You can run this in a stub mode. Uh, so all these commands are basically language independent, and that was a conscious design choice because we didn't want to get caught up in language-specific bindings. Uh, we wanted to keep it language agnostic, language independent. So yes, you can use it. And right now, we are using this with Java, with Python, with uh, PHP, uh, with JavaScript, uh, and uh, Golang. So those are the five languages we are already using this at a pretty large scale uh, currently. Uh, can we squeeze in one more? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. So uh, 
There's one more which says, uh, Shridevi is asking, aren't these integration test plans part of the Agile release train? Uh, seems like another way to track the dependencies. So, I'm not sure I understand uh, the question. Uh, are these not just another way of, uh, aren't these integration test plans? I mean, the integration tests are, are they part of, aren't they part of the Agile release train? So, where do we where do we see them in this whole agile release process? I think that's maybe. I mean, I'm second guessing, but uh, aren't these integration test plans? So I'm not sure. Uh, so none of these are integration test plans to start with. Uh, I don't. Yeah. think I would call them as integration test plans. Uh, these are just uh, you know contracts that we are writing when I'm integrating with someone else. Uh, so this the one of the advantages is you can do both. Uh, you know contract, uh, you know, consumer-driven contract or uh, provider-driven contract. So whoever gets the, the, the get-go can collaborate, write this together first, and then they can uh, start building this uh, independently. Uh, and when, as and when someone finishes their work, uh, they can deploy their piece. Uh, so this whole notion of release train, which I believe comes from uh, SAFE, uh, is just a horrible idea in my opinion. Uh, you know, uh, you want to basically move away from this uh, stupid release train analogy. Uh, this, this release train analogy is just a very, very nice way to put waterfall back into your organization. What you want is basically each team to independently keep deploying their stuff as and when they are ready, not wait for these release trains to arrive and uh, create these big batches of things where you put everything together and then wait for, uh, you know, uh, the, the, this thing. And it's just, uh, it smells of waterfall thinking all throughout, right? Like you have to plan these release trains, you have to uh, know the estimates, you have to do all of this stuff, and then you have to get everybody onto that release train. And if someone cannot get onto the release train, then what do you do? You know, it's just waterfall, right? Uh, instead, what we, we are encouraging is you agree on the contract independently, each of them uh, build those. Uh, and then, you know, whoever is ready, keep deploying it to production. Don't wait for the release train, right? Just basically keep launching missiles as and when they are ready don't wait for these release train okay great last one not a question more of a statement from mayuresh who says uh, my developers would have cried had they attended this session and i'm hoping he means tears of joy so <laughs> okay and uh, yeah we do hope we'll have tears of joy as people start using and adopting this framework so uh, Maybe that's a good note to wrap up, Naresh. Or Absolutely. Yeah, so hit yeah. up website, contract.run. It's open source. There is a quick five-minute guide that can get you up and running. Uh, we've tried to see. We can try and document all of this. So it's easy for people to get started in five minutes. And, uh, you know, it's open source. So we're looking for contributors. Uh, this is my plug uh, for, for inviting uh, contributors. So if you're interested in this, start using this and start contributing to this. Uh, and we would love to see you.